Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. We're going to do a presentation by Alethea McInerney from New Mexico PTAC, who's gonna talk about some changes to NIST 800 standards that are very relevant for anyone that is looking at um, getting into the procurement cycle for Department of Defense. But real quick, I wanna take just a couple of minutes to talk about the DOD SBIR and STTR programs because that's one of the easiest ways to actually get into the procurement process with um, the Department of Defense. And thanks to some of these changes that Alethea is going to talk about, you actually have to be compliant now before having a submitted proposal for some of these service components. But let's dive in here really fast. So the Department of Defense is one of the 11 agencies that participates in the SBIR program. Um, the SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research. Essentially, the program is a way for the federal government to inject research and development dollars into small businesses that have a really innovative idea with some commercial potential, but just don't have the resources to get started. Maybe a lack of funding, and maybe too much technical risk, but it's a way to really bolster the participation by innovative businesses into the economic ecosystem. Uh, there is a sister program called the STTR. There are only five of those agencies that actually participate in the STTR, but Department of Defense is one of them. The big thing to know about the uh, difference between SBIR and STTR is SBIR, the business can do all of the work themselves. On an STTR, you have to be working with a research institution. Essentially, the definition for research institution is any organization that is getting research and development dollars from the federal government. So universities, colleges, um, FFRDCs, or federally funded research and development centers, those types of organizations. But why would you be interested in SBIR or STTR funding, or even the combination of it? Well, it is, uh, they liken it and they like the term uh, America's seed fund. Now, some people think that's a misnomer, but it is actually a seed fund. So this is a small amount of money to get someone started. And typically you're not gonna get all the way with SBIR or STTR funding. It actually comes into play into those phases where the phase three is really just focused on how do you get to that market? How do you get that commercial success? How do you get that penetration into that market? But just unlike normal seed funds, which are typically venture capital funds, there's no equity that you have to give up. The government doesn't want any part of your business. They don't want any part of your idea. You don't have to pay the money back either. There's no commitment to it. Um, there's no repayment plans. There's no collateral. There's nothing that you really have to give up when you are looking at these opportunities. And that's why even though it is you know, kind of a seed fund, it's technically a investment. The government wants the return on their investment. The return on the investment that they want is for you to be successful, for you to grow, for you to make more money, for you to hire more people, for you to sell more product, because then you pay more in taxes and the government gets that money back somehow. But specifically under Department of Defense. So Department of Defense has gone through quite a bit of changes over the past, let's call it three years or so. It used to be that they release solicitations three times a year. Um, that has changed now with the Army. The Army actually funds all year long. What they'll do is they will release a block of topics at a time and say, hey, these topics are what we're looking for. These are the problems we need solved. These are the types of solutions we want. Why don't you pitch something to us? 
because DOD is very contract focused. They have problems, they have issues, they have things they need to address, they have things they need to solve. So they need solutions for that problem. Now where DOD does kind of differ from a lot of the other agencies is DOD uses what they call a pre-release and an open period. So under pre-release, that's when they drop the topics. They say, this is the type of stuff we're gonna be looking for. These are the type of problems we need to solve. These are the objectives we want you to obtain, uh, obtain or to kind of get closer towards. Um, DOD will actually tell you what your objectives are for that phase one, phase two. Now, once it goes into open, that means that it actually cuts off for communicating directly with the program managers. The pre-release period is your time to find out more about that topic, find out more about their problem, find out more about the kinds of solutions they're looking for, find out how they want to integrate it, find out how they want to use it, find out the environment that they're going to use it in. That's your opportunity to really dig down and make your innovation stand out from the rest of the crowd. Now, one also thing to know about DOD is DOD even has variances within the agency. What I mean by that is there are 12 different service components that participate in the SBIR and STTR programs across DOD. Actually, that's not totally true. Some of those don't participate in STTR, but all of them at least participate in the SBIR program. And each one of these service components can have some variation. They can have some differences on the funding. They can have some differences on the period of performance. They can have some differences for what they're looking for at that phase one, what they're looking for at that phase two. Obviously, they have differences on the kinds of solutions they look for because each one of these has their own, let's call it wheelhouse that they work with them. But everything can change for these. What you have to put together, the amount of budget that you get, the length of the proposal, the information that actually goes into that proposal, and some of the rules and restrictions, which we'll hear about shortly from Alethea. So obviously, as you see, there's a lot of variance, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of, well, how do I know which agency is best? How do I know which of these service components might be interested? How do I put together one of these proposal packages? What's going to be involved in this? You know, I'm lost. Well, if you are lost and you're in the state of New Mexico, when you're looking at those SBIR and STTR programs and opportunities, contact New Mexico fast. We provide proposal development assistance. Um, we provide things like topic and agency matching. We'll help you figure out your budget. We'll you know, review proposals. We'll tailor everything we do specifically towards that need. We do workshops like this. We produce a lot of videos, a whole lot of videos that dive down into the proposal process into what to highlight and why to highlight it monthly newsletters you name it we offer it the only thing we don't do is actually create content so if you're looking for a grant writer if you're looking for someone to write your proposal that ain't us but we will help you make sure that it's where it needs or that it's in the format it needs to be in that you've covered all the information that you highlighted what you were supposed to highlight, why you highlighted the particular portion you highlighted, will help you structure everything. We just won't create content because that breaks our cooperative agreement that we have with the SBA, which funds us. So all of these services we offer are totally free. And if we broke that, then we wouldn't have fast anymore and we'd probably be out of your job. But we provide everything we can to make sure that you're able to take that next step in that proposal development process for a complete and a compelling proposal package. Most of our tools and resources are actually available on our website in a living library. The information that Alethea is going to share today and that she's going to kind of highlight, I'll actually send out to everybody. 
but anything else that you want to find out about SBIR and S2 tier programs, about proposals, about uh, topics, about you know matching yourself, all of it is available on our website. And that is our website at the bottom. If you're interested in SBIR, S2 tier, never took the plunge, contact us. I'm more than willing to discuss it with everybody and I'd love to hear from everybody about what you're working on, why you think it's innovative and why you think that DOD needs to fund you. But with that out of the way, I'm gonna invite Alethea to start her presentation. She's gonna give you some really great information um, and also talk about what her organization and office does. Alethea. Thank you, Dal. I'm looking for my um, slides. I had them right here and now I can't find them. But anyway, um, I'm Alethea McInerney and I'm with the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And we help small businesses, or I really should say all businesses, get ready to work with the government, whether it's state, local, or federal. So hopefully this presentation will help you um, as you get moving forward. I think I have too many screens open right now is what is my problem. I was trying to put them all together for you so that I could share them with you. And now I think they're just way too many. So let me, oh, here it is. Let me go with that. Okay. And I'm going to start this. I'll just move everything over so that you can see it. Um, there we go. There it is. Okay. So can everyone see my screen, Del? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Okay. And um, I have a lot of information to share with you. I'm not going to um, go through each and every screen or slide, I should say, one at a time, but I am going to point out the highlights. To these slides, I have seven attachments. And as Dell said, you will receive all seven of them as I go through them. Um, I just, what I'm, my goal here is to try to get this information in your hands. You need to understand what is coming up, what you are facing, and how to meet it. And you have guidance here with FAST and with PTAC. We can help you as much as possible get through this. So basically, what we're doing is protecting federal contract information, controlled unclassified information, and understanding the upcoming qualifications for cybersecurity maturity model certification. So I'll go into those a little bit more as I move on my slides. Cybersecurity inf um, information and communication is stuff we do not want in the public's hands. We want to make sure it's safe and it's in our federal information systems and non-federal organizations which is what we fall under. And that's what I'll be discussing today. What we are protecting. Anything that's public information is going to be out there, it's released, okay? So that's, that's a given. You have businesses in place now. If you're starting your own business, you need to safeguard your financials, your technical information. And if you have employees, your personnel information, all that needs to be protected. That's the type of information we're going to be discussing as well. Federal contract information, FCI. Those, that's information that we do not want to release to the public. It's not really classified, but it's still, we don't want it out there. Controlled unclassified information is even at a higher level. And that is what we are protecting. That is going to be protected and under the 
um, control of NIST special publication 800171. And as I move through this presentation, you'll understand that a little better. The key concept is federal contract information is data that we have and that we do not, it's not really considered um, something we want in the public. It could be a banking information. It could be um, something we're gonna be working towards. Control the unclassified information gets a little bit more specific on HIPAA, expert control, personnel information, and some of your technical drawings is, you know, you don't want them out there. Controlled unclassified information is going, is applicable with the different regulations and government-wide policies. The executive order 13526 came out and gave the National Archives and Records Administration, which is NARA, the responsibility of finding out how CUI was marked and controlled. They had a huge job in front of them because every single agency marked it a different way. So they had to get all agencies to mark it the same way. So that was a huge job for them. They came up with 20 categories and you can see here how they are and they all go down a further in them. So the 20 categories is just the top level and they all go down further and I'll go into that a little bit more. But it's really description of data collected and the requirement to protect data. And you'll see the NIST Special Publication 800 here. And that's how we're going to be moving forward. To comply with FAR 52204-21 is the basic safeguard of covered contract information. Okay, that's just the basic FAR. If you've had any government contracts with federal money, I can almost guarantee that this FAR 52.204-21 is in your contract. That being said, is that you need to meet the basic cyber hygiene requirements consistent with best practices. This is very top level. There's 15 specific requirements listed in this clause and there's no third party certification. So there's no requirement to be certified. This is all self-certification on your part. You should be meeting that requirement. If you are just starting out, I can guarantee you this clause is in your contract, okay? The NIST 800-171A, I'm going to go into a little deeper later on in my presentation, but this is, was developed to help protect controlled unclassified information. And the reason I have it here is because the 15 requirements that are in this basic FAR are in that NIST, it covers it. However, it covers 17 requirements of the NIST. And what I've done here in these next slides is I've put the FAR requirements, I put the reference to the NIST, and I put the family. And that'll make a difference as we move on. But you can see this particular requirement, escort visitors, meets two extra requirements in NIST. So that's how you become 17 of the NIST requirement. That's how these 15 requirements meet those. And you can see the families are here. And I'll explain those as we move on. But even though you meet this requirement, the FAR 52204-21, that may not be the only requirement in your contract. You need to understand what other requirements could be in your contract, whether they flow down from a prime or the government, depending on the agency. Okay, basically cybersecurity is a risk management exercise. 
you want to protect your system from all of these items here. Malicious code, war ransomware is a big one. Denial of services, software what? bugs, all of that. What? What? I'm what? sorry. What? 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 <laughs> okay, as you move forward, as I what? move through these slides, you're going to understand what? that the self is, these items here are not contained in those 15 items. To, to prepare a self-assessment of your devices, policies regarding use of company equipment, cyber insurance. Do you need that? I'll tell you, not everyone needs it. But it's a good idea to understand what's covered. So you know if you should get large enough or need it in the future, what items you are responsible for. Computer files backup. Do you have a backup for your files? And I don't mean a soft copy or hit with the internet. I mean one separate from online. Because once a, a, an intrusion comes in online, it can go online to anything and you don't know. So do you have a backup that you can use to pull up your files again? And I'll explain a couple of incidents that that did not happen. And obviously, you know, because of what's been in the press right now. Train your employees. Your employees are your first line of defense. Do they know what to look for? A lot of these attacks are coming through emails and getting themselves into the system where they're sitting in the background. They're not always alert or you know where they are up front until they're ready to do whatever they're going to do. Employees need to feel that they have someone they can ask. If there's a mistake to let you know right away so you can do whatever it takes. These are things to be considered that are not in that basic FAR requirement. Okay, now what I've done here is I've taken the basic FAR requirement and I've shown you what it says. Now, remember I said NIST 800-171A a goes into further explanation of what is covered here. A lot of people heard, read this and going, well, I'm doing it. Are you really? So NIST came out and said, okay, in order to meet this, you need to have authorized users and identify, are identified and go through these six items. That's gonna make a big difference as we go through here. But basically, it's control who can use company computers and who can log on to your company computers. This NIST requirement here is the one it affects. And on those first few slides that I showed you where it said the families, that will correspond to that. This is all going to play as we go on further down in the um, presentation. But I want you to have this here for the basic, basic FAR requirement. And I've done that for all 15 items. This is access control has the most that are covered. Limit information systems access to the types of transactions and functions that authorized users are permitted to execute. So what does that mean? Basically, what it is is if you've got employees, you've got an admin, and maybe that admin does everything with the computer and then has a job doing something specific. When the admin is doing this other job specific, they should not be logged in as, to the computer as an admin. They should have a separate login. So if one of them gets breached, let's say whatever she's this he or she is doing over here, it doesn't go through the whole system because you have a firewall. But if they're open as an admin all the time, that admin has access to everything in your system. And if they get breached, 
It can go through everything. So those are safeguards that you want to have in place as you move forward. Verifying control. It's still under access control. Access control is major. Make sure to control and manage connections between. Can you also choose to limit how and when your network is connected to outside systems? That's this NIST requirement. So it goes through and explains a little bit further on what this means. Here's access control information posted or processed on publicly accessible information systems. That is a big deal. And do you have policies or do you have um, an idea of what is being posted on Facebook, on, on whatever social media is out there? And I have some examples for you on where that happened. Um, an, an employee made an honest mistake, okay? It was honest, it wasn't being mean or anything. And this is a New Mexico company. They received a promotion because of a proposal they were working on and they were excited. The employee announced the promotion on social media. That was fine, no big deal, okay? They were excited. They explained what was due, why it was due. It was due to a new contract they had won. Okay, no problem. However, included too many details, publicly released, of FCI. What they had posted, there was no oversight. So they included data that they shouldn't have included. Company estimates that this breach could have cost them over a million dollars to a million and a half because this was information that was going to be patent for the company and they couldn't patent it any longer. And this is a company in New Mexico that this happened to. It wasn't meant to cause harm, but it did because there were no processes in place within the company. You are looking at doing SBRRs or STTRs. Those are very technical information that you're going to be providing. You don't want that out there. You may want to patent it. It may be money in your pocket if you do. However, certain this company ended up closing down because they couldn't patent that information any longer. It got out there. Things to keep an eye on. Identification and authentication. Do you uh, identify who's on the system, okay, and how? To make sure that the individual has a unique identifier. Even if you have one computer and you all use that one computer, it doesn't matter. Anyone that's on that computer can log in on their own login if it's set up properly, or if they need to get to a specific area, do you have that under control? Here's the NIST with different passwords and access. This is the same authentic identification and authentication. Identify who's using it, who's on the system. Do you know who the, where the system is being used? Do you know the device? The verification is called authentication, excuse me. Verify strong passwords, hard to guess passwords. You know, using your dog, using your child's name. Those are cute, they're nice. It's not really a safe password. Your password should be at least 12 
digits. Numeric alpha special characters mixed in. That makes it a more a better password. And a lot of systems will now show you if it's red, green, or yellow, red, yellow, or green when you do your passwords so that you know it's a strong password. This is the NIST 800-171 that it blights to. Media protection. Do you sanitize or destroy information system media that you have that you're going to release? Um, we sometimes give our computers away. Have we gone all the way through the computer to all the memories that are in there and destroyed the information? Thumb drives. Do you know what's on your thumb drives? Do you know where the thumb drives are and how many you have? Using. Um, do you clean them up? So this is about cleaning up, purging the information so it cannot be read. And if you can't, can you shred or destroy the device? And maybe that's a safer way, depending on what's on it. Limit physical access to organizational information. Here you go again, going through and knowing who's using it and what. Protecting that information. Protect it from physical contact. Okay, so it goes into that. Here's the escort visitors and monitor them. When you have somebody come in your office, and I know we've been working from home, so it's a little different. And I know there's been some, your kids are in the room, your dogs or whatever. And so hopefully they don't get on your system. Or if you use the same system, is it firewall between what they can get into and what you can get into? And it's not only our computers, but what about our cell phones here? A lot of times we can get into our company emails through our phones. Is it blocked? So when we hand over our phones to our child to say, here, you can watch this movie or you can play this game, they don't accidentally get into your email and open something that if you would have seen it, you would not have opened. Those are kind of things to be aware of. Those are monitoring visitors activity, okay? Maintain audit logs, physical audit logs. Make sure that you know who's in the plant, who's when we go back to our offices, when we are doing working, do we know who's coming in and out, when and what time? Are we escorting them? It could be our family members. They're not an employee or a friend. They're not an employee. They need to be signing in on the log that says the date, the time, who they're seeing and what they're seeing them for and the time they left. That all should be recorded and kept. That will be looked for if you have an audit. Um, Physical protection, this is still part of that. Remember, there was three under the one here. Systems and communications protection. Do you protect this? And look at all the items that it falls under. And this is the NIST 800-171A that brings all this up. Do you have a fence? Do you have locked doors? When you leave your system on your desk to go down the hall, is there a screensaver or is it open to anyone that can come in and look at what you have there? Um, do you have firewalls on your systems? This goes on to protecting it further. Separate public access systems to internal. If you have access to allow people to come in and have access to your internet. Do you have a separate internet for them to use, a guest one, versus them getting onto your internet that you've got all your data on? That is part of um, separation. Some identify, report, and correct information, system flaws in a timely manner. Do your systems get updated? 
do you know if there's a software update? Can it be done automatically on your so a system or does each individual have to do it? How do you control that? That is one that needs to be looked at. Okay, systems information, malicious code. Is it looked for? Do you have anti-malware, computers and cells for malicious code? This is the NIST and it goes into more detail. So do you update? And this is going in, how often is it updated? From the emerging threats, are you kept abreast of them? Or do you have a way of it? That's that NIST 800. System and information integrity. So do you keep them scans? Do you scan your systems for anything in the background? Real-time scans, periodic scans. How do you handle that? OK. Those are just the basic, basic FAR requirements and the basic NIST 800-171 requirements. Any contract that has federal dollars will have that in them. As a small business owner, can you do it all by yourself? Probably not. But somebody can help you set it up and make it help you understand it and you can proceed? Yes, you probably for this part of it. Anyway, for the basic part, okay? It doesn't matter what customer you have, there will be cybersecurity requirements. And I can almost guarantee you that all of these agencies are going to be accepting and using the NIST 800-171. A. Okay, this to protect control unclassified information against unauthorized disclosure or loss. DOD, Homeland Security, and other agencies are using the DFARS D252.204 7012, which is DOD. DOD incorporated the NIST 800-171 into that clause. NIST 800-171 was out there to help uh, anybody. It's not federally federal requirement. It became a federal requirement for DOD when they incorporated into this clause. Need to understand that. The reason DOD did this is because billions of dollars worth of research and development data have been stolen. We can't afford that. We need to keep our country safe. With your future inventions or innovation ideas, we don't want them out. We want to keep them here in the United States. So that's how that came about. Protecting controlled unclassified information, they came up with the repository for CUI so you could understand what is considered CUI. This is controlled technical information. This is the marking that should be in it. And it goes into more explanation here and the FARs and regulations. What needs to be controlled and, and cared for is also physical media. I mean, yes, I'm talking about um, soft media being on computers and stuff, but hard copies, when we print them out, need to be stored and locked. Do you know how to mark them? They should be marked. Here you are. These are the codings that should be used sheet of paper in front of paper that you've printed out. And if you have a, a thumb drive controlled and then the coding on it, they all should be marked. So if they're left out, you know that it needs to be handled right away and you can't just leave the room with them on the table. Okay, now 
when you're going to do storage or for adequate protection through appropriate cybersecurity measures. Adequate. What do we mean by adequate? No systems are completely secure. We've already found that out, okay? But if you should have a breach and you are following the NIST Special Publication 800-171, which describes good practices, and you are following that and have records of it, your system will be considered adequate. And that's extremely important as you move forward. Okay. Securing the supply chain. This is not only going to apply to the prime contractor. It is going to be a mandated flow down to all lower tiers. Just like the FAR. 52204-24 requirements in commercial contracts. The um, supply chain at all levels are going to see that flow down. This bar here is what gives the prime contractor responsibility. The government will have access to the prime, but the prime is going to be responsible for their subcontractors. Believe me, they are not going to be held responsible without holding you responsible if you are a sub. Because they're going to do a due diligence on you. They have done it before regarding your finances, your statements, the employees, trying to make sure you're able to do the work. Well, now they're going to make sure you can protect it. If there is a breach. There is a consequences of there could be a termination, there could be past performance issue, and you could have a potential false claim allegation against you. So you need to be careful as you move forward and understand the requirements that are in your contract. Contractors who do not comply are subject to a termination for default. On top of that, you could have the False Claim Act activated. I'm not going to go into that because we're going to do what was right and we're going to move forward. Okay, we've talked about NIST. What is NIST? NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST is government-wide application of standards and guidance. That's their job, is to put guidelines off, out for everyone, okay? They do not come up with these um, guidelines and then make them regulatory. That is up to the government. DOD took the NIST 800-171, incorporated into their FAR, and now that has become federal regulations. So, NIST has come up with a special publication 800 series to provide agency guidance. There is a lot of information in the 800 series on how to move forward to protect your systems. So if you have questions regarding mobile devices, how do you protect them? There is a standard there. There's a special publication how to do um, firewalls. There's a special publication. All you have to do is look it up in NIST 800 series and you will find that. Now, the one we're gonna discuss in particular is the NIST 800-171 series, focused on protecting protection of CUI, controlled unclassified information. I know there's a lot of acronyms here and I try to keep that going. So they came up with a framework to establish the best practices approach to implementing their recommendation. Their framework core is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Okay? No one is safe from not 
being hacked, okay? I would say more companies have been hacked than not. But you can see it's a cycle. It's a continuous cycle. So what are you, what are you doing? You're identifying the risk. Remember that sheet I told that slide that had those risks? What are your risks? The assets, your data, your people, your systems. You want to protect them. Develop and implement appropriate safeguards to ensure delivery of critical services. Detect. You want to be able to develop and implement activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event. So if something gets in the system, you want to be able to detect it. Respond. How are you going to respond to it? Do people know what to do if something happens? And to recover, can you recover? Do you have those backups? Do they work? It's one thing to have a backup. It's another thing to make sure it works. The reason that is we have a New Mexico company here that had was a victim of ransomware. Okay, they had engineering drawings and they, the people or the ransom was, they took control of their engineering drawings and demanded payment to unlock them. Now keep in mind, just because you pay the ransom does not guarantee you're gonna get everything back. So keep that in mind. That's extremely important. They chose not to pay the ransom. It cost them $500,000 to recreate those drawings because they didn't have a backup item. Okay. On top of that, it cost them over $300,000 in customer work because the customers didn't come back. Can you afford that? That's your recovery plan. How are you going to recover? The NIST 800-171, I told you it had its basic, the 110. These are the families. There's 14 families. And as you can see, access control has the most. Are you controlling who has access to your systems? Each one of them is important, but you can see where the most amount is there. That's 110 requirements. So when you hear the NIST 800, 171, 110 requirements, that's the basic. That's this right here. Okay, now everyone was going through this and saying, well, I think I'm covered, I'm not sure. So NIST came up with NIST 800-171A, came up with the objectives and it addressed each one of these 110 requirements with more. So there are 210 objectives, which concludes that, uh, comes to a total of 320. You have your basic, just like I showed you on those slides, and everything that was in that blue that I said was NIST 800-171A, that's where it came from, right here. The FAR requirement, the basic FAR requirement has 15 requirements, but meets 17 of the NIST. Look at here, it only touches six of the families, six of the NIST families. And this is important to keep in mind. Okay, so every, all the other families are not touched with that basic FAR requirement. Okay, this, the items that are in that NIST 800 is to develop a system security plan, describing how your systems are, how it works and stuff like that. Conduct an assessment and um, put together an assessment report of what you have. Do you know what you have? Do you know what software? Do you know where it's at? What revision? 
has it been updated? And produce a plan of action with milestones. Now, the NIST 800-171 gives you the opportunity to put a plan of action with milestones together. The government knew you weren't going to go and meet all the requirements like that. No. They wanted you to sit down, go through your plan, do your assessment, where you're not meeting them, put it down, and how you're going to meet them. Do you have to? Some of you may not have to meet all of those requirements because you don't have that many employees, or you don't use the Wi-Fi or whatever, um, but you need to explain them in your system security plan and understand that. Now, this slide is kind of busy, but basically what I want to go through is just the FAR, the 52204-21 is for your FCI. Nearly every contract has that. Then your DFAR clause is tailored to protect CUI, and that's all these, and I'm going to go into them right now. Here's your basic FAR, which is in all requirement contracts, which the 15 controls to meet. This is your DFAR 252-204-7012. It did not have this initially, but it has it now because NIST SP 800-171 was out, is out there to help with control and classified information. That's the 110 controls. DOD incorporated that into their DFARS. Currently, it's being looked at to be incorporated in the FAR. It is not there yet, but I would imagine within the next couple of years, it will be. But right now, the only worse it is, is in the DOD um, supplement requirements. There, this all was, has been out there for some time. It was in 2016. In 2019, there was a report done, a GAO report done to see how the companies were doing. All this was based on trust, self-attest, self-certify. When you get your contract, you have, once you do your invoice, you always self-certify, you've met the requirements of the contract and you are meeting the re work that you were supposed to meet at this time and you invoice, it's signed. That's another self-certification on top of signing the contract. When they went to go check it, people were not meeting them. There are court cases right now for people who have certified stating that we have met this and we are in compliance and they were not. And the worst part is they knew they were not. They're in court. It would have been cheaper for them to meet the requirements than to be attend the court. Just a heads up. Because of that, they have come up with an interim room. The interim room is the DFARS 252-204-7019. This is self-certification in the SPARS. This is the interim room that's going to affect you right now as being STTRs or S. S-B-I-R, get the acronyms right. Also, there is going to be a 252-204-7020. This gives the government the right to have DCAA go and do an audit of your systems to see if you have really put in your proper score into that system. And the more technical you are, the more likely this will be happening. The 7012 is going to be regarding the CMMC assessments, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But that's where it is. The interim rule came out into effect on December 1st, 2020, required the Im implementation of NIST 
800171. Putting it in the system. I left this on here because if you wanted to read the comments and regulations and all of that, you can. But this is the system that you have to go, the SPR, SPRS. To do that, to register, you have to go through the Procurement Integrity Enterprise Environment login. And then I put the following slides to follow. Okay, I'm not gonna go through it, but if you have problems, just call them. They will, the, your cage code has to be in there. You must have a cage code. So if you're just starting out, get in touch with us at PTAC and we'll help you get your DUNS number and cage code so you can move forward with this. But you cannot get in this system without a cage code. Just keep that in mind. Okay. You're going to meet the requirements of, you're gonna score a self-reported base on NIST 800-170-A. It's a self-assessment of the 110 requirements. The 110 are the basic requirements. That's why you're gonna keep hearing the 110. The 200 objectives explain further what's in those requirements. And I'll show you right now. With this, there's three levels of confidence. You're gonna have your basic, your medium, and your high. Your basic is going to be meeting the FAR 52204-21. That's your basic requirements and you should be meeting those. Your medium and high are when you're starting to get more into the CUI, controlled and classified information. But even with your basic requirements, you need a system security plan. It is going to be in your contract if you're receiving DOD dollars. Okay, so be careful. This is the DOD assessment methodology. This is where it came out. This is what it looks. This is a handout that I will give you or to Dell and to pass on to you. But what I want you to notice, you see this right here with the star? That's your basic bar requirements. You need to look at those slides that I showed you earlier that I pointed out, the 800-171A, that's where the explanation came from. You need to meet all of those items to be able to keep that value. Because what you do is you take anything here. If you're missing, that particular one had six items to meet. If you are not meeting one of those items, you neg are taking away five points for that item. It's not a partial. You take away the full points because you're not meeting them. And that's how you go through it. And depending on the item, you can see their different scores. So you need to keep that in mind. That's why the NIST 800-171A is so important. You'll see that it matches the 171, but the A goes into further detail on what's required to meet this. Okay. When you do your SPAR scores, right now they're looking to make sure you're putting your SPAR score in. However, if you've had federal government contracts or anything, you should be meeting that FAR 52204-21. Doing that and meeting all the requirements and not subtracting anything and not subtracting any of these with the star, your score should be a negative 140. That's the lowest score you should have. That's the lowest score you should be shooting for. Once you put that score in, does that mean that's it? No more? No. You go in and every time you meet something or you in better yourself, go in and update your score. And as long as you're updating the score and getting better and better, they're going to see that you're working on it. Basically, the government has gotten to the point, trust but verify. They're trusting you to do your self-assessment 
but they're going to get to a point where they're going to start verifying these scores. Keep that in mind. Okay, these scores, I just put them there as if you met the NIST 800-171 and to the different levels of the CMMC, and I'll go into that a little bit, these would be your lowest score. By meeting all the NIST 800-171 requirements with no poem, no plan of action, you will meet the 110. Okay? Just... The NIS came up with a handbook to help. And I have this as a handout on self-assessment handbook for assisting on the NIS special publication 800171. There's some good information in there on what to look for and how to meet it. So that comes in extremely handy. Um, the goal is to go from a self-assessment, which is your basic medium high and go to the CMMC. The CMMC is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Now, it was hoped that they would have been able to have all this in place by now. But because of the turn of events, it is not. That's why the interim rule is in effect. So you've got more time to get yourself together and still do a poem. When you go in for this certification, it's going to be based on a third party assessing your compliance. And I'm going to go into it further. Now, this certification is based on the NIST 800-171A requirements. That's going to be your base. When you're going in for your CMMC, certification, because it is an actual certification, there are additional requirements added to it, except for level one. Your, this is the requirement for the DFARS 252-204-7021, the cybersecurity maturity model. And there it's going to be where you're going to be safeguarded. Is it going to be perfect? No. Is this a one-time thing? You get the certification and forget about it and say, okay, I'm done. I've met it. Here's the book. No, this needs to be a living document. Anytime you update your systems, anytime you go forward, your security system plan needs to be updated. So you're going to go in for the CMMC. There's five levels. And depending on where you are, I suspect this is my, sus my suspicion that you are working on SP SBIRs or STTRs, you're going to need to be a level three. Why do I say that? It's because you're probably going to have controlled unclassified information. You're probably going to have technical information that we don't want out. So you're probably going to be working towards a level three. By meeting the NIST 800-171A and all the requirements in there, that's going to be working your way to that level. Okay? Now, level one is safeguard federal contract information. That's level one. Level two is you're going to start putting progress, progression of, to protect um, CUI. Level three is you're going to protect controlled, unclassified information. Okay, that's where I see you. Now, maybe you won't, but with the type of work or inventions you're coming up with, innovations, you may. Level four and five are at a higher risk. Those are probably your larger companies. CMMC model structure has 17 domains. Where the NIST had 14, they've added three more here. NIST will get you up to this one. Good cyber hygiene. But it will not get you to the certification for CMMC level three because there are additional requirements here. But you can see how it goes up. 
you're going to be performing. Level one requires the organization performs the specific specified practices and basic cyber hygiene. Okay. Now, let me explain something to you. As I'm going through the CMMC level, right now, we are in an interim rule. That rule says that you will put a score, a self-assessment score into the SPAR system. And you are going to see it in your contract. And I already know that for a fact because I've had clients come to me saying, what is this? Supplier performance risk system. That is where you're going to put your score. If you are going to get any DOD funds, you're going to need a system security plan. You can't just do the assessment. You're going to need a system security plan in place. And they are going to request it. They want the information. They want to know what the document, when the document was created and when it was dated. So you're not going to be able just to go in and meet the FAR 52204-21 and say, I met it. And that's it. You're going to need to put a system security plan together. Now, for the certification, when that comes around further on, it doesn't have that stringent of a requirement. But I will tell you that when they do your assessment, they are going to look for that plan and how you're going to meet it because they're gonna say, how do you know you're meeting this? And as you go through, they're gonna have level two is documentation and so forth and so on, where you go through, I'm not gonna go through all this right here because you can read it. This is the cybersecurity maturity model certification requirements. It gives you level one, level two, level three, level four, and five, which I didn't put on here. And each one is based on the other. Like level three, there's nothing here. That doesn't mean there's nothing. That means you've met this one, this one, and you don't have any additional requirements. In here, it gives you the clauses and what you can look at for further information or clarification on how to meet that. Okay, I've given you the site for this so you can see the whole document, okay? The CMMC certification, which is coming out probably in the next year, well, there will be some, certifi some certifiers by the mid-year of this year, but those certifiers are going to be extremely busy with those pilot programs. So that's why that interim rule is that you're going to end up putting your scores in the CPARs and DCAA will have the right to come into your companies and do a self-assessment. That is not going to be a certification. It's going to be an assessment. Are you meeting what you stated you met when you put in your score? Where is your system plan? They are going to look for that. Third party assessors are being trained right now. And they are going to be the ones that are going to assess you. Now, if you have a way of not having controlled unclassified information on your particular system or all the systems in your company and you can put it in one place, then you need to protect that and explain how you're doing that and it stays away. There are different ways of meeting it. And there's a lot of information out there, okay? But you need to understand that the assessors, the third party assessment are going to be paid for by you. The certification level is a separate price on that. The two different things. It's going to cost some money. You need to start planning for it now. As a small business, look out for grants. 
right now, if you start working towards this requirement and start meeting it and start seeing where you need help, there is going to be funds out there. And the reason I'm saying that is because Katie Arrington, who's in charge of this, has already said that on different webinars that she has given, okay? She's overseeing the CMMC. Right now that it is a requirement, there are going to be different grants from different agencies. There's going to be help from the primes because this is all new. And this needs to be met now not tomorrow, should have been met yesterday. That's not going to happen. It needs to be met now in what you are doing. So don't say, I can't do this, forget it, because this is gonna go state and local. The state are looking at the NIST 800-171 requirements now. So it's gonna go, there's too many breaches. We need, to get this under control, we need to stop bleeding. The NIST 800-171 is a way to do it. It's not gonna be the only way. It's gonna keep evolving as things go on. You saw it on the paper with the pipeline. It's going out there, it's happening. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be federal. So just get going, look for them, look for the MEPs, look for the EDDs, look for the um, your, your government, your state and local. They're out there and see what they can do to help. Okay? Don't just throw your hands up and say, I can't do this. This is just too costly. No, we're going to need to protect the information. You need to protect the information in your system. You're in business. You are the backbone of this country. We need to keep you in business. We need to keep going. You need to move forward. Just like before when they said, you need a cost accounting system. You need to be able to put your books together. You need a quality control plan. You need a program management plan. Now we need a security plan. We just need to pull together and do it. There is help. You've got the fast. They are tremendous people to work with. If they need help, they'll come to us. We'll help you as much as we can. We'll pull what we, everything we know and hand it to you. I've got information on what we've covered, how to meet it, resources. This is the FAR. This is the NIST. This is the CUI. This is the DFARS. I've given you the links because I don't want you to say, well, she said it and she's just making this up. No, read it for yourself. Understand how it's coming out. Here's the link for the self-assessment. Here's a template. Department of DOE has not flown that down yet, the NIST 800-171. But if you read this directive, you will see it's in there. So it's going to hit DOE sooner than later. These resources here have trainings on them that you can look at and use to help train your employees and yourself as you move forward and what to look for. The Trade Federal Trade Commission, if we were together, they have a, a handbook that's called um, Cybersecurity for Small Business. This handbook, and I know it shows up backwards when you see it, has some things to look at. Like, what do you look for when you want tech support? Okay, what do you ask? What do you ask when you find out if you have need cybersecurity insurance? What should you ask? What should you expect? The more of the NIST items that you have covered and that you are doing, the less expensive that insurance is going to be for you and your company. What if you want, um, I mean, it's full of good information. It goes into physical security and, and stuff like that. It's not that thick, it's very short, but it's only 25 pages. You can download it from the Federal Trade Commission site, but it gives you some ideas. 
It gives you some ideas of how to work with your employee, or what to look for, or what to think of when you're hiring that third party um, to help you with your systems, to know what's there. These are some of the companies in New Mexico that can help you towards that. Now, two of these companies have registered practitioners. Basically what they're doing is they're going through the CMMC training and have passed the class. Okay, they are not assessors, but they can help get you ready. Of course, they're gonna come with a price, okay? These are out-of-state companies that have, are out there as well that can do it with the NIST 800-171. They cannot certify you and they know it because there are no certifiers that are prepared to do that yet, okay? You have the Rio Grande chapter, New Mexico Tech, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP. Now this one here, Project Spectrum, I would highly, highly recommend you get on that website. And the reason I say that is because the Department of Defense has given them a grant to help businesses get ready for the CMMC requirements and certification. They have videos on their site for the different levels and what is needed. They have people you can chat with, okay? And this comes at no cost. The only thing you need to do is register on that site. There is a lot of information, a lot of technical information that's up here. I, I can give you the requirements, but I'm not technical. I can't tell you which firewall to use or what works best or who's out there. They can help guide you. Okay, this is a site for the CMMC model, the accreditation body, the audit preparation, they're all here. The supply chain, talking about the supply chain and going through. These are all sites that you can go and look. It gets overwhelming. There's a lot of information, but at least you have an idea of where you can go if somebody says, I can do this for you, you can. I can certify you, you can. Before you accept their word, go into this one, the accreditation body, go to the marketplace and see if they're listed as a certifier. You're not gonna find any right now, but you will find registered practitioners in New Mexico or whatever, wherever you're at. Okay, I hope this helps. I'm sure I've given you a lot of information. Um, I have stuff that um, I can show you, but as you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna go ahead and just give you the information. If you have questions, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to. If we were in class, I'd show you how to work them side by side. I don't know how to do that on the screen, so I apologize. But if you put some of these documents together and lay them together across, you'll be able to do the certification, the FAR requirements or the DFAR requirements, the NIST 800-171. The one document I am gonna show you is, if I can get to it, is the, I have put a worksheet together. And in this worksheet, I have put the NIST 800, the requirements, which is on that slide. The NIST 800, 110, plus the um, objectives, which comes out to the three. And I've identified the FAR. When you do your plan of action, you do not want any of these requirements on that sheet. You're going to want to work as hard as you can to get these off your poem. Okay, especially if you've had contracts before. These are the requirements. This has the, the NIST requirements. This column will have, the column A here, will have the 110 requirements. That would be the NIST 800-171. 
the 171A, which is the objectives, is in this requirement, and it gives you what they are. And you can go to that document and it will match. I've put down what the um, requirement is. I put it against the family. If there's any response, what you need to do to meet that requirement. Some of them is configuration. Some of them could be hardware, software. Some of them could be policies in place. In column H, I put the scoring for you for the S part. So if you want to meet the higher scores, then you might want to look at the ones, once you've met the FAR requirements, go here and look at which one has the higher score and go and try to meet those. So that will bring up your score, okay? As you go through, and I also put the NIST 853, because this is the, what the government uses to meet these requirements. But in the last column, I did put the FAR requirement so you could see them. Now, here is the, the slide, the, like I have it on the slides for you, the requirements. Here, I color coded them for the NIST, for the CMMC level one, two, and three, NIST 800, 171. That's how I came up with the, the yellow you're going to see is going to be for level one. Level two is going to be green. Level three is blue. So if you want to just work with these separate, you have them here but they are all together here in the different colors. So you can see what you're looking at. I've also on the, um, one of the documents that helps, that refers back to this, you're gonna see the same color coding on it. I've tried to put it so you can know what you're looking at and to move forward as much as possible. Um, if there's something else I can do to help you, please let me know. We're here to help you, Dell, the FAST group, my RP tax. We're here to help you, to help you succeed. So if with that, if there's any questions, if I can answer them, I'd be more than happy to. Dell, I think we finished a little early, but if there's anything I can do, let me know. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for uh, the presentation, Alethea. Um, so we have a couple of moments just for a couple of very quick questions. If no one has any questions, I want to thank you all for joining us today. This session was recorded. The recording will be going out later this week, along with that information packet from Alethea. But as Alethea did mention, I will make sure that both of our contact information is available. If you have any questions about SBIR or STTRs, please don't hesitate to contact me. If you have any questions about NIST, the 800 um, series or uh, DFARS or anything related to that procurement cycle, please don't hesitate to contact Olivia. But thank all of you for joining us here today. We greatly appreciate it. And we hope that this information was very valuable and useful to you. And we hope to see you at our next event.